Hi. In this, the second of two of three webcasts on dealing with uncertainty, I'd like to talk about a tool that value investors seem to like, which is the margin of safety. Now, the margin of safety is nothing new, and, 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 it's, and it's a pretty intuitive tool. In fact, it's been around a long time. I think it predates Ben Graham, but Ben Graham was one of the first people who put those words on paper. He talked about the margin of safety, and he talked about how critical it was for investors to have a margin of safety. Now, Seth Klarman, of course, made this concept into a, into a concept that, that caught on. And in fact, his book is almost legendary in its reach. Legendary partly because it's so widely tracked by value investors and also legendary because it's so difficult to get. In fact, I think it's out of print and costs almost $2,000 in Amazon to get the book. But here's the essence of the margin of safety. There are two processes out there, right? And this is something we've t I've talked about before. There's the value process and there's the price process. You using whatever tools you bring to the table, value a company, a value a stock, value an asset, and the market price delivers a price. And if the stock, if the value is greater than the price, then you should buy the stock. The margin of safety steps in the middle and says, just because the price of an asset is less than the value, you shouldn't quite jump in and buy the asset. Why not? For two reasons. One is your estimate of value could be wrong. We, when we all make errors in judgment on valuation, and the second is even if your value is right and the stock is underpriced or the asset is underpriced, the market might not adjust the price to the value in your lifetime or mine. So there's noise in the market process and noise in your value. And for those reasons, you need a margin of safety. That's pretty intuitive. The question of how you come up with value, though, can vary across investments. And I'll come back and talk about that because I think, you know, when people talk about the margin of safety, what they use as value can vary. Some people use an intrinsic value model. It could be a discounted cash flow model, a dividend discount model. It could be accounting value. A lot of people, when they talk about value of an asset, talk about book value or liquidation value or tangible book value. Or you can even price the asset where you use a multiple and comparables and tell me that's the right price for the asset as opposed to what's actually out there. But I think the essence in all of these approaches, you're looking for a, diff a gap between the value and the price, which makes you comfortable investing in the stock. Fair enough. So let's think about why we have a margin of safety. We have a margin of safety because we can be wrong on estimating value. And we can have a margin of safety because even if your value estimates are right, the market price might not move to the value. What do you gain from doing it? Well, you're less likely to make those mistakes when you buy something that you ch think is undervalued and it turns out to be overvalued. And we'll come back and talk about whether there's something you lose in the process, but that's the primary benefit. And the other benefit that's offered by people who promote margin of safety is that it's less likely to have a catastrophic drop in your price if, in fact, the value is high enough that it acts as a kind of floor on how much the price can drop. Those are the benefits, and I am willing to buy, buy into them. In fact, I can understand the intuition. I can understand the allure. But there are lots of misconceptions about margin of safety that trouble me. Here's the first one. I mean, when you think about margin of safety, we act as if there's one number out there, 15% that we all agree on, but it actually varies across investors. It varies depending on the value approach, as I said, that you use. It could be intrinsic value, it could be asset-based value, it could even be pricing. It varies in magnitude. I've, I've run into value investors who claim to use a margin of safety of 10%, 30%, I've even run into a couple that use a 50% margin of safety. I have no idea how they find anything to be cheap, but they claim to use a 50% margin of safety. I've run into some value investors who actually vary it across investments, with riskier investments having a bigger margin of safety and safer investments having a smaller margin of safety, whereas others say that's not discipline. You have to have the same margin of safety. So even among those people who use margin of safety, there are differences, and here are the misconceptions that I think drive the margin of safety that I think we need to be cautious about. The first is that using a higher margin of safety is costless. I've heard value investors say, what's wrong with being conservative? And what's wrong with being more conservative rather than less conservative? Why not just push up the margin of safety and use a really big margin of safety? Sounds alluring, right? Sounds like something you would do. But I'm reminded of, in statistics, the type 1 and type 2 errors. Remember that from statistics? If you increase the likelihood of one, you might also increase the likelihood of the other. So let's talk about what the margin of safety does and the trade-off it creates. When you create a margin of safety and you increase that margin of safety, I think about 
you reducing type one errors. What are type one errors? These are when you when a stock is overpriced and you think it's underpriced, you end up buying the wrong stock or failing to sell the right stock if it's already in your portfolio. So by improve, increasing a margin of safety, you reduce the possibility of type one errors. That's good. But you also increase the likelihood of type two errors. What are type two errors? These are underpriced stocks that you end up not buying because you pushed up your margin of safety. And there's a cost there. The cost is if you'd bought those stocks, you could have made money. Or if you already have the stock that you're selling the wrong stock because you've used too large a margin of safety. Now, will that trade off work in your favor? That's that's for a judgment you have to make. But here are two things, two questions that I think will help you answer that well, answer that basic question of the trade off. The first is when you look at your portfolio, do you find yourself more invested in cash consistently than you'd like to be? Right? Let's face it. Every investor needs some cash in their portfolios based on the risk aversion and their needs for liquidity. Let's say it's 5 or 10%. If you're consistently at 30, 40, 50%, you're over-invested in cash. So that's the first question. Are you consistently over-invested in cash? The second question is, ultimately, investing is about making money. Do you actually earn a return on your portfolio, cash included? That is more than you could have made investing passively. In other words, if you take in your 85% stocks, 15% cash, which was your preferred portfolio, and put it into index funds, would you have earned a higher or lower return than what you made in your actual portfolio? If your answer is yes to the first question and no to the second question, I think the trade-off is not working in your favor. It might not be just the margin of safety that's at, at, at fault. It could be that your value is wrong and that the market's not working the way you want it to. But whatever the reason, the investment process you're using is not working. So when you think about increasing your margin of safety, think about that trade-off. You're gaining something, but you're also losing something. Second misconception about margin of safety, which is if you're using a big margin of safety, it doesn't matter how good you do, how well you value a company. I've actually seen people say, well, I don't care that much about my valuation. I don't take much care because I use a big margin of safety. If your value estimate is sloppy, then I don't care how good your margin of safety is, it's not going to protect you. So I think even if you adopt a margin of safety, you have to start off with an estimate of value that is a reasonable one. We all make mistakes, but you need a value process you believe in that actually delivers values which are more than random. The third misconception about margin of safety, and this is something I've had trouble grasping, is why the margin of safety is the same for all investments. I mean, intuitively, I'd expect a much larger margin of safety on my riskiest investments and a smaller margin of safety on my safer investments. I'd expect a larger margin of safety when markets, when I'm investing in markets that are incredibly inefficient and illiquid, and a smaller margin of safety when I'm investing in markets that are efficient and liquid. I'd need a larger margin of safety when I can control, when I cannot control the catalyst, the, the process that causes price to move to value, and a smaller margin of safety when I see catalysts on the horizon. But I think the notion that the margin of safety is the same for all investments troubles me. There's a fourth issue with margin of safety that I think we need to grapple with. Margin of safety is designed for individual stocks, right? So you're saying, I need a margin of safety of 40% in an individual stock. But let's say you have 20 stocks in your portfolio. Will the margin of safety across your portfolio be just a weighted average of the margins of safety of the individual investments? I don't think so. And here's why. On each individual investment, you're going to make mistakes. But if those mistakes are company specific, they're going to start averaging out across your portfolio. What I'm trying to say is the margin of safety you should be using on investments should be a function of how diversified you are as an investor. If you have only three, four or five companies in your portfolio, you probably need a much bigger margin of safety than if you have 15, 20, 25 stocks in your portfolio. And that's part of the reason why if you're a mutual fund manager with 100 stocks in your portfolio, I don't see what role margin of safety is even playing in your investment strategy because your the law of large numbers should bail you out much more strongly than a margin of safety on any individual investment. And here's my fifth misconception about margin of safety. And this is something that gets thrown at me, and I literally thrown at me whenever I value a company. And as you know, I use beta or beta some traditional portfolio risk measure to come up with the cost of equity and capital. And, and, and I know many of you don't like those measures, and I'm completely okay with that. In fact, I am willing, and I've done this in my valuation class, to come up with 10 different alternatives to betas, all of which will do the work that betas did and perhaps not create the hot spots that betas do. But once in a while, I will run into a value investor who says, well, I don't use beta 
in my in my valuation, I use margin of safety. And what that tells me is the person has absolutely no idea what he or she is talking about. Because to use margin of safety, you need an estimate of value, right? To get to a value, you need a risk, risk estimate. So margin of safety is not a substitute for beta measures or risk measures in valuation. It's an add-on. It's a secondary. It's an additional risk measure you're bringing in. No problem if you're bringing in the risk measure, but don't tell me that this is the way you adjust for risk and evaluation because it, it happens after the valuation is done. So if you want to use margin of safety, then I think you have to make this judgment for yourself. And it starts with you looking at your own portfolio size. If you have a small portfolio, you're a much better candidate for margin of safety than if you have a big portfolio. It depends on what kind of investment philosophy you bring to the table. Some investment philosophies which require concentrated portfolios might require a much larger margin of safety than investment philosophies that are less concentrated. Investment philosophies where the price adjustment to value will happen over long periods might need a much larger margin of safety than where there's a trigger to cause the correction to happen. So I think that you need to bring your views about markets, your views about value into the process and make your own judgment. You have to be honest with yourself and keep looking at whether it's working for you by using those two questions as how much of your, ca your portfolio is in cash and are you actually beating the market on a, co on a collective basis with your margin of safety in place and maybe f tweak it and come up with a better margin of safety for you. The second is, I think if you want to use margin of safety, you have to start off with a value process that is a sound one. It doesn't have to be a discounted cash flow valuation. It could be an accounting-based valuation, but you need to spend some time and resource and energy kind of coming up with that process. And third, I think you have to be flexible. You can't have one margin of safety that you apply across time periods, across companies. I think you need to adjust your margin of safety to reflect the market you're in and the companies you're investing in and let it vary across companies. So here are the determinants, I think, of what your margin of safety should be for an individual company. The first is the more uncertain you feel about value, the greater your margin of safety. That's, that's a given. But I think the caveat would be if you're a diversified investor, you care less so you can afford to have a much lower margin of safety. The second is you've got to look at the source of the uncertainty. If the bulk of the uncertainty you feel in a company is company-specific, then your margins of safety can actually be lower, especially if you're diversified, because that risk is going to average up. So if you look at my Valiant and Volkswagen valuations, you'll notice that my margin of safety is actually fairly small because in my larger portfolio, I'm willing to take the law of large numbers working in my favor. Market efficiency, the more efficient you believe markets are in correcting their mistakes, the smaller your margin of safety might be. So this might be a reflection of how little you trust markets or how much you trust them. And finally, the greater the likelihood of price catalysts causing the, the change, and if you can be the catalyst, even better, the smaller the margin of safety can be. So as an activist investor who can sometimes be your own catalyst, you might settle for a smaller margin of safety than, a, than an investor who is not an activist investor, who has to wait for something to happen, for the price correction to happen. So that's pretty much what I wanted to say about margin of safety. I'm glad you were able to, to hang in there with me, and I wish you the very best.